So tonight, I want to talk about um, Dharma gladness, Dharma joy. Um, And there's lots of different flavors or ways of experiencing Dharma joy, but, and we'll talk a little bit about that, different kinds, but in particular, I want to talk about um, dukkha and faith and their relationship to Dharma joy. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a uh, description, a simile of what... um, I'm feeling into through my practice around this is kind of uh, imagine that um, the Dharma joy, the Dharma gladness that I'm talking about is um, it's just that little, those little, like many, often many smaller moments of uh, delight, surprise, connection that feeling of being fully present, right? Of like, wow, feeling the sun on the skin, something really simple or a bird, right? Landing somewhere where you can see or um, just the, somebody's eyes making connection with yours, right? Just, it can be, um, it's, it's a really a moment of meeting, meeting our experience in the moment and it, comes with some degree of upswelling. And um, so I kind of have this image of uh, maybe a river or something um, that's flowing, right? The present moment of flowing, this movement. And then there's all these little tributaries or kind of, it's funny in my imagination, um, the river's up higher than these other things. This is just because of the feeling of it, right? And sometimes we're more in the muck of things. We're more in the mind and worry and more in the dukkha of life. And it doesn't feel like we're gliding along in that sort of clean, smooth feeling, joyous kind of presence. But um, there can be this kind of, we might be kind of in the muck a bit, and something can happen. Something can come along, something can shift, and we can feel this upwelling, this upwelling and this lift, and then we get to be in that current of the moment. And so um, this is sort of like, the simile is, you know, the slower, muckier places can be where we get stuck in things and we're having some degree of suffering or we're clinging and we're just not really in the flow. And as we're going along, if we remember, if we notice what's happening, if we have some clarity about what's going on, if we see we're suffering, the first noble truth, we might be able to recognize what we're clinging to what we're holding on to. And when we see we're clinging, when we see with wisdom that we're kind of stuck, if we have been practicing and we've watched this dynamic, we know, we know that if we keep clinging, it's only going to get worse. And so we let go. And in that letting go is that possible moment of upswelling, the faith, the belief that if I shift in how I'm relating to my experience, (sighs) yeah, I can move more freely. So, this is the little simile that I'll kind of come back to. And um, I'm going to move through these three things, this the dukkha, the faith, and then the dharma joy. And um, I'm going to read you a little short quote about the joy, and then I'm going to talk about the suffering, 
and then the faith, and then back to the joy. So Tar Brock says that joy arises when we are open to both the beauty and suffering inherent in living. Like a great sky that includes all different types of weather, joy is an expansive quality of presence. It says yes to life, no matter what. So saying no to life might be the equivalent of suffering. (laughs) Right? When we um, say no to what's happening. In the Dhammapada, there's a couple of verses um, that kind of talk about the mind and happiness. And they go like this. The mind, hard to control, flighty, alighting where it wishes, one does well to tame. The disciplined mind brings happiness. The disciplined mind brings happiness. Here's another one. The mind, hard to control, flighting, alighting where it wishes, one does well to tame. The watched mind brings happiness. When it comes to dukkha and kind of seeing where we are caught in life, Sayadaw Utejaniya says, um, we need to learn our lesson. There's no shortcut. <laughs> and we really have to find a way to relate to our suffering in a way that, um, you know, helps us choose joy, choose happiness instead. So watching the mind... Right, learning to watch the mind and sort of like watching your footsteps, you know, choosing where you're going to place your feet. We can be like that with our minds. We can choose what what trains of thought we're going to follow, what rivers we're going to choose to ride. And as we watch the mind and see, kind of and get to know its contents, its habits, its patterns, that's... It's like, you know, in that boat on the river, we become more skilled, getting more and more clear. Oh, if I go down this tributary, it's going to be really sticky. <laughs> and we, ch- we can choose not to go that way. The Buddha um, talked about five spiritual powers or five spiritual faculties and that these are said to be incredibly important for our practice to move forward. And they are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And um, they're progressive. Um, we start with faith. It's necessary for us to step into the practice. And it's like an on-ramp. It's on the, an on-ramp to the flow. <laughs> And um, yeah. So what happens when we get caught in our suffering? You know, why why don't we just, if we know the way out, why don't we always just choose to be happy or easy or whatever? Not so. Not so simple, but made me think about um, like this idea. Can you think about a moment of very mild s- stress, suffering, dukkha you might have experienced recently? And just notice whether you were aware of it and then notice if there was any tendency to either kind of just resign or resist. Either just say, oh, well, I'm going to just do it wrong anyway, so I might as well just go for it and be, you know, suffer here. Or, you know, no, I don't want it to happen that way. I don't want it to go this way. I don't want to feel the way I'm feeling, the resistance. Very often when suffering happens, 
We either give up, resign, or get indifferent, or we rebel or resist. It's very often our response is, well, mine, is it yours? You notice, is that familiar in your practice? So that sense of resigning, giving in, or giving up, or resisting, trying to fight reality? I saw one head nod, yes. Does that mean I'm not not talking? I want to make sure I'm talking to all of you. (laughs) All of you. I need to change what I'm saying if I'm not getting you right, right? So, okay. So there's an alternative relationship we can have, which is this one that, you know, when, when we see suffering... When we start to learn to see it as, um, oh, I'm holding on to something. Oh, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. It's like feedback. It's, It's that simple. It can be seen so simply as just stop, wait, look what's happening. Notice, pay attention, wake up. A simile for suffering that I really like is, um, similar to the river thing, but this is on the side of a freeway or highway usually. You ever drive down the highway and you start to veer off the road and you hit those rumble strips on the side that kind of like make your tires vibrate and your car bounce really quickly? I kind of think about suffering as like rumble strips. It's when we're veering off the course, when we're move, you know, moving off the path, it's like this natural feedback that we're going the wrong way. And uh, we, can, <laughs> we can resist <laughs> and just keep trying to you know, drive on the rumble strips because we think we should be able to drive over there. You know? Or we can give up and drive off the road, right? Or we can go, oh, this is really irritating, but thank you for waking me up. Thank you for, like, giving me feedback that I'm about to drive off the road here. Doesn't mean we can think, you know, we have to feel like it's a pleasant experience or, but we can be grateful. And we can have faith that they're placed there for a reason, that they're there to help us stay on the road We have a choice. Another way, um, yeah, I like to think about the this relationship with suffering is very from a very uh, kind of a, I guess, a therapy-minded position, which is um, when we are when we're hurt, when we're, you know, in a situation where we're being harmed, the fight or flight response comes up, right? Which is typically, we either fight it, right? So we're resisting it, same thing, or we're running away, right? Those are the two main responses to being attacked or harmed. Um, to fight or to run, and then the other response is to freeze, right? When we haven't been effectively able to escape or fight back, we tend to go into a neurological state of freezing. And to me, this is kind of the same thing. It's just that the dukkha that we're experiencing in life or the stress is, is not something, you know, like being attacked, but our nervous system responds similarly. So if we can start to see suffering in a different way, maybe a radically different way, we can see that it's like it could potentially be that on-ramp to joy. It helps us see we have a choice. And 
if we know we don't have to suffer, if we know we get to choose, it's really natural to feel a sense of faith and hope, right? When we recognize, I can do something right here. I can shift how I'm relating to what's happening. There's a, wow, a, like how amazing is that? And that can be like a, a that transition from the suffering with the faith to that joy. So the faith is what grows in us as we start to see ourselves over and over again. Um, Seeing how we make things life, make life more difficult for ourselves or easier for ourselves. Right? When we engage with the practice and we're paying attention to our lives. We can notice what the practice does for us. We can notice that it helps us be more present be more connected, be less afraid, be less anxious, be more open. Some of the things that also can support our faith in the practice are reflections on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Right? So the teacher who got free, the Dharma, the teachings, and the Sangha. This is a sangha. Look at this. Be a source of inspiration, aspiration, support, and can help us grow our faith. I think faith grows in when we, we take in this kind of goodness. Take in the goodness of the practice. And said that um, in the Samyutta Nikaya, it is faith that is one's partner and wisdom that instructs. And faith is one's greatest wealth. Do you feel you have faith in the Dharma, the Sangha, or the Buddha? Do you feel you have faith in your practice and that it can help you or that you've seen others? Does that support you? Yeah. It's a precious, precious thing for us. And um, yeah, you know, seeing, even seeing somebody else and their goodness or seeing how they've changed through their practice can grow our faith when we can't see it in ourselves. Keep looking around. So this faith is the supporting condition for gladness, for joy. It helps us stay on the path, stay present. It helps us keep choosing this radical act of turning toward, turning toward, turning toward. Anne Lamont, uh, she, wrote, she has a quote I'm going to read for you, which I love. She says, Almost everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, scared, and yet designed for joy. Isn't that great? I think that's just such the greatest quote. Just, you know, we've all got this stuff going on. And we're designed for joy. It's right there. It's right in us, the capacity to experience, connect, to feel. And I don't just mean like, you know, you don't have to be like fireworks going off. Just that, that feeling of that flow, that feeling of presence, that feeling of, it can be like wonder, right? Awe, ah, appreciation. Joy is the heart's celebration of life. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Anthony DeMello says that, you know, so there's this idea that we've got to say yes to the joys and the sorrows, right? To connect with 
life. We don't get to say no to the dukkha. If we shut down to difficulty, we shut ourselves down to joy as well. Right? We have to sort of learn how to be with it all. So Anthony DeMello says, when there is absolute cooperation with the inevitable, this is when we're really in our practice. Absolute cooperation with the inevitable. This idea that where we're not trying to resist that we're already depressed, resist that we're already anything. We're here, we're right here, we're in our moment. And when there's absolute cooperation with, okay, here it is, right? This, this, that is kind of like that on-ramp to the freeway, to the joy. We, we can't divide the present moment into good parts and bad parts. We disconnect one from one, we disconnect from both. No, I don't mean I don't mean we aren't discerning in our lives. I don't mean I mean talking about meeting that mo- the moment, this moment that's already arising. I don't mean don't be discerning about your plans or your jobs or who you do things with. It, discern, 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 choose wisely. But you know, once we're here. We're here. This is it. You know, this is it. This is now. This is what we've got. So once we're right here, we don't get to press a race. Life is additive, not subtractive. Yeah. So joy is that openness that includes both the joys and sorrows, aliveness and openness, available to the whole play of existence. And the thing to remember is, um, you know, joy and gladness don't come first, right? Um, Fearlessness follows fear. Practice follows forgetfulness. Seeing follows not seeing. Peace follows truth. You know, it's like the gladness can follow the suffering, the faith and the suffering. It doesn't have to come first, right? Faith is there to help us remember, help us see there's another way, an alternate route, a different way than habitually responding and reacting. There's a man named Ross um, Gay, and he wrote a book called The Book of Delights. And he um, he decided to write this book, and so he went about it like every day, going into life looking for little delights. And of course, it was a wonderful experience for him because the more he looked, the more he saw, right? And he's just like tumbling into delight after delight. But one of the amazing things that he says that he puts together is that our suffering and our our joy are not so separate. And one of the things he says is, what if we joined our sorrows? What if we joined our sorrows? I'm saying, I'm saying, what if that is joy? Where we really come to ourselves really come to this experience, we join it instead of resist it. What, what kind of a mindset would write such a thing, right? What has he experienced that he could say that? I wonder, you know, I, I was thinking about this and I thought about being with somebody who was dying, actually. Somebody who I love deeply and being with them, so present with them, right? So here, you know, this is a sorrow, right? This is a a loss. And being with him and being in that sorrow with him 
was a joy. It was such a joy. It was so alive. He was dying, but what does that mean? He was the most alive person I knew at the time. Joko Beck, Charlotte Joko Beck, um, she has some nice quotes on joy and differentiating it from happiness. And she says, joy doesn't mean the same thing as happiness. Happiness is the up, up, up. (laughs) I like that. Up, up, up. (laughs) Joy is the peace in what is. The reality is that when we experience the moment fully, for whatever it is, joy is revealed. Do you want me to read that again? Yeah? Okay. Joy doesn't mean the same thing as happiness. Happiness is the up, up, up. Joy is the peace in what is. The reality is that when we experience the moment fully, for whatever it is, joy is revealed. So, like, how do we have that mindset, right? What do we need to do to support ourselves? You know? I like the quote, right, from, from, uh, was it Tony Morrison? Designed, designed for joy. What if we believe we're designed for joy? That it's right there. That it's right there. That it's accessible. That it naturally arises. It's not something that we have to make happen. Rather, we have to be available for it. Willing. To let go into it to receive it. And there's something right there. A friend was talking about uh, giving a talk on Dharma joy and how everybody was so resistant to feeling joy. For me, that's that negative negativity bias in our brain, right? There's this part of our brain that's always more biased toward the threat, what might be negative. And it it just wants to pay more attention to that. So this is where I think we have to make ourselves available. We have to recognize that deeply ingrained survival strategy that's not doing us so good anymore. And step back and go, okay, yes. Yes to joy. Yes to gladness. Yes to receiving a teeny tiny moment, a sip instead of maybe 24 ounce or supersize me drink, right? It's, it's, it's a small bit maybe, bit by bit, but how do we keep saying yes, right? So I wanna just invite you to take a moment, close your eyes, and just, just see if you can connect, see if your mind can offer you a memory or the imagination of an experience of this kind of Dharma joy, that gladness or happiness, this aliveness maybe even might be a word that could be used. It often feels spontaneous. Just sort of like a gift that pops up. Just connecting with that, whatever comes up, and notice what does it feel like in your body as you recall or imagine. What do you notice? 
How willing are you to sip it, to breathe into it, to let it soak in, to come in deep? How quickly is the mind ready to dismiss it and rewrite it or move on? (coughs) Maybe also take a moment just thinking about the rest of your evening tonight. Imagine what it would be like if you really received the teeny tiny little gifts of ease and well-being, just the softness of a pillow or a blanket, the flavor of your toothpaste or the clean, clean water that you drink. Clean water, what a gift. What would it be like to really open to each of these little sips tonight? And lay down and put your head on your pillow and just feel it flowing through you. All these little gifts. May it be so for you be so. I wonder if any of you um, would like to share anything about a question or a reflection at this point. We're winding up. I have a few more quotes I can share, but if there's anybody that feels inspired to share anything right now. I'd like to create space for that. Jim has a microphone, so if anybody wants it, he will bring it to you. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I think you're right that uh, when I'm meditating and I feel uh, a moment of um, mindfulness or awareness, I think there is some joy there, but I think that what happens is that I I do tend to dismiss it and and to say, um, oh well, this is this is the the most that I can that I can mm-hmm. feel, mm-hmm. I, and there's and there's so much more that I'm not able to access, <laughs> <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, rather than just appreciating the joy that is there. Thank you for sharing that. It's like sort of. Again, this image of this river, and you know, you're, we're skimming. We get a little bump, right? And then it's like, but I didn't get all the way over there, you know. But it's that. It's just like, oh yeah, feel the bump, feel the little bump, and just be like, sweet. <laughs> just oh, thank you. Yes, let me say yes to you. Not no, 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 no. Then it goes like it goes like that. No, no, no. <laughs> you know back down in the muck and then it's back slow 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 come back and then you got another little bump and you know it's like this process right where we just not good enough should be better yeah that, I just appreciate what you shared so much thank you yeah yes saying yes yes to the gifts yes little little ones are good <laughs> anyone else feel Interested. Here we go. Thank you. It's funny what came up uh, when you were speaking about joy was um, I, I always park about the same place uh, when I go to my office. It's about five minutes from my office. And I walk, I don't know, on this nice uh, residential street. And there's something about, I think, like getting out of my car and the businessness of listening to whatever I'm listening to and just... Uh, 
seeing the birds mm-hmm. or seeing the sun often and just um, having those five minutes uh, mm-hmm. it just brings me right there and, uh, yeah. yeah one of my most profound <laughs> Like I shouldn't call it that, but a, a very memorable retreat experience was just walking meditation, right? But then a little bird was in the bush and it popped out, and I just was had the gift of a flood of like delight. It was such a simple thing, but you know, here I, I maybe was just practicing with trying to be present so I could receive the gift, but it was really profound. Really small little things, very moving and helpful, right? Starting your day that way every day. What a nice choice. What a nice gift. Hmm. Anyone else feel inspired? Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, dear Sangha. Um, I really appreciate you showing the difference between happiness and joy because I feel like happiness is almost like a semi-permanent or permanent expected, expected state of being mm-hmm. that I've never been able to get to. Mm-hmm. But I do experience joy frequently throughout the day. It's really helpful Aww. to know the difference. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, Charlotte Joko Beck has another sentence in there about how, you know, in the West, in America, we're like so conditioned, we have so much, you know, we have so much material and access to all this stuff, and we're just kind of grown to have some sort of expectations that we should be happy, and we should just, we should be happy because we have things. It's just not, that's not happy, that's not joy. (laughs) I'd much rather have joy. Much rather have joy. So I'm really, really uh, grateful you shared that. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Mm. Any other comments, questions, reflections? No worries if not, just creating enough space for you to decide if you want to go for that microphone. Just receiving just the delight of this sharing, this space together. I'll just say um, to notice the flavors of, of gladness, the shades of gladness, the colors of gladness, of joy. There's, it's, it's, it's a huge range, actually. And you know, the mind, because of its orientation toward the negative, it it can very easily skip over anything that is neutral to slightly positive. Even, even really like positive feedback or nice things that can happen. If we don't attend to them, if we don't meaning give our awareness to them, our appreciation, if we don't receive them, let them come in, they slip through, they're just gone. They don't get committed to memory. They don't get that attention. They just slide on. But one trip, one awkward moment gets a lot more attention, a lot more of our awareness. We're much more inclined to tell somebody about something that was hard, even couldn't find parking. I had to drive around the block for, you know, six times. And, but then they got out and they got to walk for five minutes. 
in this beautiful neighborhood. And they don't even mention that. They just talk about how they had to drive for, you know, too long to find parking. It's just the way the mind tends to operate. It's how it's evolved and how it's been conditioned. It's not bad. But we need to, we need to watch the mind. That's what brings us happiness. We start to learn how the mind operates. And we then can start to learn how to relate to it in ways that are on ramps to joy. So I feel like that's probably the last thing I should say. May you all choose on ramps to joy. (laughs) Thank you for your kind attention and participation. And uh, for those YouTube people out there, Jason, Graham, Jane, thank you for your little chats tonight and for joining us. Namaste. Good night, everybody. And may the benefit of our practice be for the benefit of all beings. May everybody find little on-ramps to joy.